Welcome. We will go ahead and get started in just a moment. Good, good morning. Hi, good morning, Femi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning from my side. I'm joining from Mexico here. <laughs> from where? From Mexico. From Mexico. That's really good. It's really great. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, thank you. Nice meeting you. All right, we can go ahead and get started. So we are recording this session and it'll be available um, through the ASABE YouTube channel um, after we're done. So I'd like to thank you for joining today um, for the third part of our global collaboration series uh, that the Young Professionals Committee is putting on. Um, so I am hosting this panel today along with uh, Roselle. Um, so if Roselle would like to maybe take a moment and tell us about um, some of the goals of the YPC in this series, then we'll kick off. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yep. So um, YPC is a group of early career professionals whose goal is to um, primarily provide relevant information for graduate students and young professionals who are less than 35 years old. Um, we have several events throughout the year, which include networking, professional development, and as well as different trainings. And as for um, us for this global collaboration series, we have identified the specific gap that young professionals face in terms of collaborating with various professionals in different fields. So we want to give them a head start about the expectations and requirements, um, as well as the process that collaboration or global collaboration in general entails. So as Jaden said, this is already the third part of our global collaboration series, and you can find the first and second part in YouTube, which I will um, share later on. Jaden? All right, to kick off this panel on building sustainable partnerships for global collaboration, we have three great speakers today and they're gonna start by um, sharing a quick slideshow, kind of an introduction to their work. And then after all of our speakers have talked, we'll open uh, for questions to the panel. So I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Patrick Sowers. He is an assistant professor of professional practice in engineering for Sustainable Development and the faculty lead of the Humanitarian Engineering Program at The Ohio State University. In this role, he leads experiential learning programs, conducts research, and instructs courses related to engineering for sustainable development. He's passionate about developing engineer socio-technical competencies to address complex global challenges. So with that, Dr. Sowers. Thank you for the, the kind introduction, Jaden. So excited to be here today, uh, sharing a little bit about our humanitarian engineering program and a little bit of my background. Uh, so a little bit more about me. I'm assistant professor of professional practice, um, essentially a teaching faculty here at Ohio State. Uh, most of my focus areas around sustainability and this idea of humanitarian engineering uh, mixed in with a little bit of engineering education, really looking at what are our students learning by taking part of these experiential learning uh, programs and opportunities, and then what is the impact on the communities or partner institutions that we're working with? Uh, I was the 2024 SAB Robert E. C. E. Stewart Engineering Humanities Award winner, and then I'm also the faculty lead of the Humanitarian Engineering Program. So what does that look like? So our Humanitarian Engineering Program is open to all uh, engineering students and non-engineering students here at Ohio State. We have the Humanitarian Engineering minor, community-based learning courses, um, which we have currently about a dozen courses um, working locally in Columbus to all the way to East Africa and Tanzania, a lot of the programs that I lead. The course that I'm mainly responsible for is the Global Capstone Design Sequence, where students um, from right now, 10 different undergraduate 
engineering backgrounds are working together on what we call community impact projects. So these are real world projects scoped through our part, project partners and collaborations, and then iterative in nature year to year, really looking at addressing the needs of our end users and community partners. And then we also have what's called the Impact Engineering Lab, which I'm um, very excited to share. Uh, we'll be opening a brand new facility uh, around this space in spring 26. So this will be a, a kind of maker space, community engagement space, where we'll house our water treatment research, a little bit of our agricultural research, and then a space where students can prototype, test, design, um, experiment before taking their uh, solutions out into the field. And then some of our, a little bit more about our community-based project work. So like I mentioned, we have projects here in Columbus all, and all the way to East Africa and Tanzania. Um, the three that I'll be talking about briefly are our work in Honduras, Tanzania, and Ghana. So one of our program's examples, uh, the Majumarwa Tanzania project, which has been ongoing since 2015, working with the University of Dodoma, which is the largest public institute in Tanzania, uh, the rural Maasai community of Marwa, and then the Kilimanjaro Hope Organization, which is a grassroots NGO uh, in that region. So within this program, we've had over 250 students, multiple universities, multiple colleges engaging. We had students complete internships uh, and some of the biggest outcomes to date as the project is still ongoing is three community implemented rainwater harvesting systems, which have been implemented at two schools and one medical clinic. Uh, another project example that we have been ongoing since 2016 is our community engaged learning course in Ghana. So this is with partner United, Adam there and his OSU polo in the middle of the gray shirt. Uh, he likes to implement what he calls sustained livelihood projects. So a lot of these projects are in the water agriculture space, working with local community members, uh, individuals on long-term uh, sustainable projects on their farms or gardens or just around the home. So our students work on these projects and then travel uh, for a, about a 10 day trip in December to collect data and implement. And then a little bit more about uh, the main focus of my work is working with what we call the Agua Clara ecosystem. So here at OSU, we work on research, innovation, design, and empowerment of our community partners and our partner, Agua Clara Reach, uh, focusing on uh, passive water gravity treatment, really is focusing on techno technology innovation. And then we have a number of university partners that we work with, Zamorano University in Honduras, University of Vidoma in Tanzania, and then other uh, American institutions like Cornell and New Jersey Institute of Technology. And then working with our implementation partners, such as Kilimanjaro Hope Organization, Ram Vikas, and Agua Clara Pueblo, the, the technology is implemented. And then those partners continuously engage with the water ministry, banks, international um, institutions, as well as the community partners. So it's not always that my students are engaging directly with the community or end users, uh, but through this, this kind of thoughtfully crafted ecosystem, which allows for uh, a little bit more experimental design and learning amongst the students uh, and helps to engage ethically with our community partners to ensure that we're not putting any marginalized communities at risk. Then a little bit more about this course. So um, the course was originally, the partnership was established in 2018. We were going to run the course for the first time spring of 2020. Uh, we all know what then happened there. So we had a, a little bit of a hiatus for the course, came back and ran the first time last spring. Uh, within this course, we had about a dozen students that travel with us to Honduras to visit the uh, Agua Clara treatment plants, which you see in the bottom photo. Um, there's 25 plants have been built serving around 100,000 people throughout Honduras and Nicaragua. So students working with Zamorano University students travel to the plants, collect data, and then decide on how do we scope projects for the following year. So two projects that came out of last year's trip working on a, a small water turbine that will be retrofitted into the plant to produce electricity for lights and hopefully eventually UV treatment. And then the second is a, a prefabrication of the water treatment plant for rapid deployment. And then what does that look like from a, a student lens? So the other course that I am primarily responsible is the global capstone design sequence. So our students work with real life community partners on real world projects um, that have, have impact so this project that was ongoing for a number of years was looking at how do we convert the existing Agua Clara treatment process and um, plant, which is currently made out of concrete uh, plants ranging anywhere from two to 
110 liters per second, depending on the community size. This student group uh, over a number of years was working on how do we prefabricate this effort. So you can see in the far left, the students worked in a SOLIDWORKS model. And then the second one is, is actually a literal trash can that they prototyped in a rapid prototyping exercise that uh, the middle is a five gallon bucket. Uh, but really the idea was getting them hands on, getting them learning, thinking about what are some of the challenges that we're gonna see when this um, is to be implemented. And then over a few more iterations came up with the, the prototype that you see on the far right. Uh, and then I'm very happy to share some of the, the impact of this, right? So this photo is from July. I was in Honduras on an implementation trip with our partners at Agua Clara Reach and Agua Clara El Pueblo. Uh, this is the workshop that we were setting up uh, in Tegucigalpa to eventually produce these prefabrication plants. So this was the prototype one of the flocculation. And then very excited to share this will actually be implemented live. Um, in about two weeks, they'll set up the first system for pilot testing and then the, with the goal of January being implemented in some of the communities that we're working with. So from our end, really we're focusing on how can we weave students into the engagement process, but then also acknowledging that while working with undergraduate students, sometimes the process is a little bit slower navigating the semester and the turnover of students. So um, some of the lessons learned from this, really having strong international partners, um, like our partner, Alaparo Playbo, they're Honduran um, founded and run uh, since 2005. So really allowing at times as needed for us to defer to them to, to understand the cultural context or the, the areas that we're working with and has, has been successful. And then, um, yes, this is my email. If you have any questions or comments, uh, always happy to chat uh, or, or learn more. And I look forward to answering some questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sowers. Um, and as a reminder, we're gonna reserve all questions to the end, uh, but as you've thought of questions, you can go ahead and send those in the chat. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Reyes. So Dr. Emmanuel, or Manny Reyes, completed his BS and MS degrees at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and a Master of Philosophy at Silso College, Cranfield University in England, and a doctorate at Louisiana State University. All degrees are in agricultural engineering or related field, and he has more than 40 years of experience working on water quality modeling, natural resource management, and regenerative agriculture. He's an agroecological engineer designing food production systems that mimic nature. He has extensive experience across, across the globe in research, extension, and education, and implementing applied natural resource engineering research in the United States, the Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Nepal, Guatemala, Honduras, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Tanzania. Currently, Manny is focused in the Philippines and Cambodia. He was a faculty at Kansas State University for eight years, of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University for 23 years, and at the University of Philippines Los Banos for five years. Currently, Manny is a consultant of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, the Research Triangle Institute-led, USAID-funded, Upskill Philippines Project, an adjunct professor of Kansas State University Biological and Agricultural Engineering, and Royal University of Agriculture, Agricultural Biosystems Engineering, Cambodia, and a senior fellow of the Southeast Asia Regional Center for Graduate Study in Agriculture. So as the president of Regalo Nkilik Foundation, Inc. in the Philippines, World Health Foundations, Inc. in the USA, and Kingfisher Park, Peron, Palawan, Philippines. So thank you. And with that, uh, Dr. Reyes can share his presentation. I don't think we can hear you, Dr. Manny. If you can unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Maybe Sorry about that. Start so, the presentation again. Thank you. That's great. So, so thank you. Apologize for that. But anyway, thank you for the invitation. And I'm excited to be with the ASAB family, knowing that I have been out actually engaged in international work. 
your some of the ages of those who are engaged today is double my I double their age, but I'm really excited to engage with you. I always want to introduce my lovely wife Lorna, and this is in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Uh, she's a software engineer at SAS in Cary, North Carolina. I actually live in Cary. Uh, my two kids, Micah, who is a budget design engineer, and my son Zach, who is a Google engineer at uh, at uh, at the Google uh, headquarters in California. So because of USAID's investments, I have been engaged in the Philippines for 20 years and in Cambodia for 14 years. Sorry, late, I have been with ANT and it's a sustainable agriculture and natural resources management innovation lab. As, a, as an advice to the graduate students or the incoming faculty, it takes a lot of work to really engage in international work. So it takes a lot of um, time and effort, especially if you're engaged in a 12 hour time difference, which is my engagement in Southeast Asia. I'm also, I got, I moved to Kansas State University and the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab. These are all USAID funded grants. And then right now I'm currently back to NCA and here as a consultant for an upskill Philippines project and handled by the Research Triangle Institute here in the Research Triangle Park. Now, the first research I did, there were a lot of collaborators. I did not put it in the slide, but there were like 20 collaborators. And this is around scientific evidence that vegetable agroforestry works in the Philippines. And this is a picture of our research in the Philippines wherein we, this is a eucalyptus tree. And we discovered or we found out that actually with a vegetable in tree interaction, there are several vegetables wherein the yield increases with the tree than without the tree. So that's a pretty encouraging uh, discovery we had. Of course, it would depend on the vegetable and the tree. There's a very, very unique vegetable in, in vegetable tree interaction. And we tested 30 species of vegetables in partnership with the World Vegetable Center and with the World Agroforestry Center. And this is a eucalyptus tree. Our conclusion was around 30 meters spacing with the trees being pruned, we might have that good interaction in several vegetables. So we're applying that technique on a 30 meter, in, meter spacing in between trees. My second research was in con conservation agriculture and I'm quite convinced that conservation agriculture works in Cambodia and also in the Philippines it will work. What is conservation agriculture? Pictures are in Cambodia. This is minimum soil disturbance. This is a permanent no-till plot. This is a permanent organic soil cover plot, the same thing in Cambodia. And this is a diversification of species. We've reached up to five species in Cambodia as a cover crop. And this works in that region of the world and I'm taking it to the Philippines. This is a depleted, very sick soil. This is an enhanced, very healthy soil in Cambodia. And this is a beautiful system in Cambodia right now where in they're growing cover crops. So for the past 14 years, I have been engaged in Cambodia and I've seen this right before my eyes. Also, I've seen a lot of vegetable or agroforestry systems working as well. Was the partnership sustained? That's the question that, we, that was posted to us. In the Philippines, what we did was to institutionalize the research. And we institutionalized it through a private training center as an experience. I had several plots were in because we wanted to be, uh, we wanted to be applied. We contracted with several farmers. And by the time the research is over, we will have a beautiful, wonderful research plot, but the rent is no longer there. So the farmers usually do what they want to do after the rent is over. So we didn't have any continuity in the plot. So what we did in this research is I engaged with the scientist himself in the Philippines. He had a nice private land. And from there, since he is passionate with conservation agriculture with trees, we developed the conservation agriculture with trees learning center that is in Claveria, Misamis Oriental in 
the Philippines and that center is still in existence and actually it's an accredited center in the Philippines. So the key on sustainability is institutionalization. The same thing with Kansas State University in Cambodia. In 2024, we believe that we will be able to institutionalize the teaching of conservation agriculture in the Royal University of Agriculture through the almost eight years Center of Excellence in Sustainable Agriculture and Intensification and Nutrition. And this has again been institution about to be institutionalized. Actually, it's already in the in the in the uh, in in the Royal University of Agriculture, not all, not as a project, part part of their, their their program, not a program, but part of their institution. So the, my current engagement is transforming conventional agriculture production systems in the Philippines to agri ecologically engineered biosystems, enhanced regenerative agriculture enterprises. I will build on the current collaborations I have with Cambodia and the Philippines. I have given you, so I have given you examples of ongoing collaboration sustained for many years. I am inviting the ASAB family to engage with me in my in the new aspect that I believe agroecology should approach, which is biodiversity enhancement, regenerative agriculture enterprises. No, I'm taking this as, as one word, as one word, because all three enterprise, regenerative agriculture, and biodiversity enhancement must be in one. And I also invite design design students, if you want to engage in the place that I engage in the Philippines for this type of a design system, I'm inviting you in the Philippines. I'm actually engaged in Coron, Palawan, Philippines. And this is Coron, Palawan, Philippines. It's beautiful. There's a lot of flatlands in the Philippines. The Philippines is an island nation. So we need to find agricultural production system, biodiversity enhancement production systems, such as the land, is enhanced because much of the natural resources in the Philippines has been destroyed. So with that, I wanna thank you and I'd rather go to the answer, to the question and answer to respond to questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mani. That is, that is a lot of projects. <laughs> I will say, but yeah, as a reminder for questions after we hear from all of the all of our speakers about um, the current research that they're currently engaged with and the past research that they have been engaged with in the past. So for our third speaker or third panelist, um, he is Dr. AJ Shah, a professor in the Department of Food, Agricultural and Biological Engineering at The Ohio State University where he leads the Biosystems Analysis Lab. He is also the director of the NSF ERC, Transformation of American Rubber Through Domestic Innovation for Supply Security, or TARDISS, and Program for Bioproducts and Environment um, Pro. His expertise is in engineering solutions for enhancing the sustainability of agricultural production and bio-based systems with local and global implications. More specifically, his program focuses on, first, production of diverse biomass, including alternative natural rubber, energy, and feed crops. Second, harvest and post-harvest logistics and processing of diverse biomass. Third, upcycling of organic waste for added value. Fourth, uh, developing appropriate technologies for smallholder, smallholder farmers in developing countries. And fifth, enhancing the techno-economics and life cycle environmental impacts of all of these bio-based systems. So Dr. Shah, I will give the floor to you now. Thank you, Rosil, for wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting uh, us to join the, be the panelist today. So can you see my screen? See the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, so... <clears throat> Yeah, so thank you, Rojil, once again. So uh, um, I'll 
since you gave pretty good introduction, so I'll skip my introduction slide and then I'll go to my lab slide. So basically, uh, the overarching mission of my lab at Ohio State is to enhance the circularity of ag agricultural and biobased systems for sustainable food, feed, energy, fiber, and materials production, whereupon we work on different components of the supply chain, anywhere from biomass production. Uh, we have engineered several systems to improve the logistics of moving the biomass crops from one location to the other in more sustainable way. Uh, we do work on pre-processing and conversion, and then we also work on waste upcycling um, as well as we conduct the systems level analysis to improve the techno-economics as well as life cycle environmental impacts of different systems. So some of the strategies that our lab implement is to utilize and conserve the resources, utilize renewable resources, improve the productivity, minimize upcycles waste uh, with the view to reduce the cost as well as evade the environmental impacts. So uh, our focus is uh, a lot on the US-based systems, but we also do work on the international system. So I would pretty, uh, briefly introduce some of the, um, some of uh, two of my international research work, and then um, would like to, and would also share some of the steps that we followed in order to, uh, for our engagement. So, <clears throat> so first, project is on kind of like exploring climate smart crop residue management options in Nepal. Um, and then uh, the second one is to evaluate, uh, develop and evaluate a novel grain drying and storage system for use in developing countries with focus on Tanzania and Jaden Tatum uh, has been instrumental on kind of like furthering this work. Um, so, so, so I would, I would, take an example of the uh, crop residue burning project and then kind of like uh, just walk through some of the steps that we took in order for us to build as well as uh, thrive and flourish our partnership. So this project is uh, basically uh, the uh, exploring the climate smart um, uh, crop residue management practices with focus in Nepal. So Several few years back, we started thinking about like some of the overarching uh, problem in Nepal, and then um, and then we we came across that most of the farmers in Nepal um, uh, uh, burn the residues because they don't have the sustainable means as well as enough labor to sustainably uh, harvest the residues after they uh, harvest their grain. Uh, and uh, rice and wheat is uh, the main crop in Nepal. And I was a little bit familiar of, uh, with it because I, I, I originally come from Nepal. Uh, so uh, so, so they, then we came across some of the studies which uh, suggest that there was around um, uh, two point, uh, around 3 million metric ton of residues were born and then which accounted for more than 20% of the overall residue generated in the year 2016-17. And it had like, I mean, you can just think or imagine from it, it has like lots of negative environmental consequences. So once we identified the problem, we started kind of like uh, talking with some of the partners in Nepal. Uh, as the first stop, we reached out to National Innovation Center, which is uh, basically, uh, and Dr. Mahavir Poon, he's the social entrepreneur and he does lots of work with kind of like uh, getting the technology on everything, lots of different things from kind of like improving the agriculture, health, equipment, and a whole bunch of things. So he's pretty well known figure in Nepal. And he, uh, he develops like lots of, uh, lots of technologies or promotes partners. So we reached out to him. We had a good conversation. We kind of like... Uh, um, while we were having the conversations with Dr. Poon, we also reached out to several other uh, to expand our partnership. So we reached out to several other agencies. For example, Nepal Agricultural Research Council is the apex body of agriculture research and extension in Nepal. They have presence throughout the Nepal. And then um, we also reached out, uh, partnered with Agricultural and Forestry University 
uh, and then we also partnered with Prime Minister uh, Agricultural Modernization Project. Basically, they we they have like huge focus on ag mechanization. So together, we had like really good set of problems identified. We can read from some paper, we can speculate, but these are the resources where we got the actual factual data from the from or the ground data in Nepal or the perspective on what would be the big big overarching this year. So we started planning, and in the meantime, we came across uh, the call for proposal from USDA for Foreign Agricultural Service. Basically, uh, we, uh, and then we submitted. Uh, after we came across, we targeted the call. We worked together all the entities, and we submitted the proposal. And we were also successful with the proposal. So uh, we uh, our the title of our proposal was exploring climate smart crop residue management options in Nepal. Actually, it it builds upon our uh, planning from the beginning and our interest. Uh, so and our some of our main objectives were to evaluate the socioeconomic and agronomic drivers of crop residue management. Uh, analyze the environmental impact of the cr different crop residue management options in Nepal, as well as kind of like promote the learnings, uh, findings from the project. So we are uh, currently, we just completed a year into the project, and then we have made significant uh, uh, significant progress. Uh, and sorry, I have not... Uh, uh, I have not put together the results from the uh, from the in the, in the presentation today. But if you want to learn more, I'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, so 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 we have made significant progress, and it's all has been collaboratively with our partners in Nepal. So that has been very effective. Uh, and then uh, my other international research project is the development and evaluation of novel integrated grain drying and storage system for use in developing countries. Uh, and our focus is on Tanzania. So it actually originated from the support from um, one of the USAID iAgri project that phased out uh, several years back. So we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, after doing some due diligence, we found out that their grain storage is a big challenge. There is already lower productivity, but in addition to that, even whatever they produce, they lose a significant amount due to not having the efficient and cheap methods of storage. So that is where we started working on this project. And then Jaden, as you see here, she's here. She kind of like played a significant role of expanding it and uh, furthering it, um, um, uh, and then this is the pro photo that she took uh, in 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 Tanzania while she was going there to understand the socio-economic perspective of our of our system. So, in a nutshell, that project was uh, uh, mainly focus was on kind of like uh, de developing the improving drying and storage system. Use by repurposing some of the 55 gallon drums that you can see here, which are in surplus uh, due to the uh, uh, due to the trades, and then um, and then and then repurposing it so that the farmers could use it or modify it easily or cheaply, so, and then store it. And then our goal was also to compare it with the other existing uh, existing technologies that have been uh, currently being used. Uh, used uh, for grain storage. So our system was uh, uh, pretty competitive or in lots of cases were better in terms of cost as well as productivity uh, uh, compared to some of the existing systems. And then again, like there, uh, there is a need for more elaborative research in this area or more pilot testing of the system. But we, we, we have been very enthused with it and a paper just came out um, uh, and there will be more coming out um, in near future. So now in my last slide, I would just like to kind of like summarize some of our learnings, which we thought were the factors for our success or the success that we have had so far. So first thing is we definitely need to have like efficient planning, which would be everywhere from kind of like building the partnership, um, uh, identifying the right kind of problem, putting the teams together, 
And then once we have those, we need to differently without resource, nothing can be done. I mean, everybody has great intention, but it's kind of like, unfortunately, it's hard to do any work without having enough resources. So that is where I think uh, trying to look into different options for how to support the work or the initiative that we build, which could be small initiatives or from the local international sources or from the US-based sources, or, or it could be pretty large um, uh, USAID projects like I agree and something that Dr. Uh, Rias talked about earlier. Um, so, and then kind of like, we also need to understand that the every country has their own legal and regulatory compliances. So we have to kind of like uh, be fully compliant in order for us to eff effectively and efficiently work with them. Uh, for example, uh, for in order to conduct the social work or the human subject investigation, we had to do IRB which is required by US, but also it's kind of like they're in different forms, it, it's required in Nepal and Tanzania. So we learned, I mean, being the engineer, we were completely unaware of kind of like what the IRB is, but we had to learn through it. We had to go through the process. Ultimately, we were successful. We were able to include our partners within our uh, IRB document and then kind of like, uh, and after we completed, we feel accomplished. That is what I would say. And then that also helped us further enhance our, I mean, work. And then uh, definitely every, when we talk about international, every country has their own culture and also having some kind of awareness of their culture and being kind of like respectful of their culture as well as their thoughts is always helpful. And likewise, the communication is uh, very effective. I mean, we need to have effective, it should be one way communication. The thing that helped us quite a bit was, uh, I mean, we, we, we used to have, and we still have very healthy two-way communication. We discuss the things we think, I mean, something that we feel like, oh, it would work from, by sitting in US may not work in Nepal or Tanzania. So kind of like having open conversation has been very helpful. Definitely uh, uh, being respectful to others thought has been, uh, is, is, is the most and supporting each other with the initiative is definitely the most. And then at the end of the day, whatever we'd learn, it's good to kind of like uh, uh, bring it to the stakeholders knowledge or the uh, person who are interested in learning on it. Uh, knowledge through different outreach and extension uh, modes. So with this, I would like to definitely thank my current and past members of the group who has uh, significantly contributed on different projects as well as our different funding sources. And with this, uh, that's my last slide. So I will we'll be happy to take any questions now, I guess. All right, thank you. Uh, we do have a question that just came in directly to Dr. Shaw. So if you could address, um, can circular agricultural practices be integrated into large scale farming to improve sustainability in the production of food, fiber, and bio-based materials while reducing environmental impact? Yep, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very nice question. So I would say yes, but is it easy? That's the question, right? It's not easy because it's kind of like if we just try to implement some of the practices directly on larger scale agriculture, it would, it would, uh, it would, uh, the, it would be kind of like resource prohibitive, but also, so it has to start from everything from the lab to bench to the pilot scale testing on the small plot. So once we are successful with it, those could be translated. Uh, for example, uh, these days, if we see, I mean, biochar has been, uh, there has been lots of work on focused on using biochar as the soil amendment, which is basically, if you think in a way that biochar can be produced from the agricultural residues, I mean, and we are circulating it back to the agriculture so it's kind of like circular agriculture, circular practices, let's say. Is it completely circular? I would say no, because none of the system can be completely mm -hmm. circular because there are always losses. 
uh, and slacks in the system. But uh, uh, as I said, I mean, it yes, it can be done, but it's not easy. There is kind of like uh, stepwise, we need to make the transition and it, it can be done. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, next, I'd like to ask a question to all of the speakers. We have, how can researchers from low, lower resource regions gain access to research infrastructure and obtain funding through international collaborations? So maybe Dr. Reyes, could you start? That's an excellent question as always. Um, the key I think is to have a thick skin. You, you just have to publicize yourself talk to as many persons as possible, establish that key network. In my engagement with ASABE, I got very much engaged with Dr. Tio Dillehey. Maybe most of you know Tio. And he just called me that there was a Sandrim grant. And I wrote with all my heart for that Sandrim grant. And that's the way I got into international collaboration. Now for, for low resource regions like I've worked with Vietnam, Indonesia, the Philippines a lot. Right now in the Feed the Future Innovation Labs, the monies in agriculture go to the Feed the Future countries. Most of them are in Africa and the ones that are in Asia are actually Nepal and Bangladesh. So all the Southeast Asian countries is no longer Feed the Future, even Cambodia. So what, as far as I know, what USAID did is that all the investments of agriculture in countries all over the world, they concentrated it by law to feed the future countries. And as I was relaying, most of them are in Africa. So what country are you from, Rania? There is Honduras and Guatemala, which are feed the future countries. And you I need to engage- I'm from the Philippines. Oh, Rania, you're, so you're from yeah. the Philippines. So you're-, you're, you're, you're so Filipino, huh? So yes. <laughs> in the Philippines, what probably you're you're aware that there's a lot of our state universities and colleges who are receiving some form of funds, a lot better funding than at least when I was in the Philippines during that time. So that's one. Upskill Philippines, USAID has been investing some funds. I got into USAID right now, upskill, because of my former contact at North Carolina AT State University. USAID missions, there are, that's essentially the experience I have. Rania, Rania did I pronounce it right? So it's, it's pronounced as Rania. Rania, we, we can, we can yeah. continue to talk about this because I have a lot of networking in, in, our, in our country. If you want to re-engage back in the Philippines, it will be good. We can talk to each other individually because this would be a highly individualized answer. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. Yep, Thank I'll you, reach Rania. out. Thank you. Yes, yes, please, Rania. I can add a little bit to it. For example, uh, when we started uh, working, uh, the uh, Foreign Ag Services uh, from USDA has the program with, from which we got the funds. It's not a big amount, but it's 50,000, which kind of like, uh, we can do a lot of work with it, uh, with some in the developing worlds. Uh, so, 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 so the part of it goes to the kind of like uh, mm -hmm. our collaborators in Nepal for them to implement the project. And part of it is kind of like uh, allotted for to bring some scholar uh, from Nepal to work in US for two or three months to get some training or the fellowships. And then part of it is kind of like to do some work in the US, but that has to be directly, for example, some of the modeling work or uh, so. So that is how there are other, there are mechanisms. And I think rest Dr. Rias covered pretty well. And then I think I just wanted to add, and there are lots of other uh, agencies who, 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 who are interested in funding international projects. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sowers, do you have anything to add? No, I think uh, pretty similar sentiments for me, but thank you. Yeah. Um, now, 
Uh, I see a raised hand, Tui, if you'd like to unmute and ask a question to the panelists. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. So thank you so much uh, to our panelists for uh, those profound uh, lecture series. It was really great, and I mm -hmm. kind of learned a lot through each of the sessions. So my question is, what kind of influenced uh, the choice of the countries that you all are working in? Is it basically based on the need? Uh, is it need-based? Like this country need this particular thing and you decide to write a grant that is tailored to that? Because I'm just thinking about the choice of Ghana uh, in Africa, for example. Why, why Ghana? Why not Senegal? Why not somewhere like uh, Nigeria or whatever? So what, what kind of uh, influences the choice of the countries that you all have worked in? Is it based on the funding or based on the need of the country or based on the development mm -hmm. that you think are relevant for each of the countries? Thank you very much. It's based on the funding agency. So USAID is very clear. Ghana is flowing with money. If you're from Ghana, it's flowing with money from Feed the Future Innovation Labs. So it's based on, on the aspect of agriculture and talking about agriculture. It's based on the funding agency. Like, you're, you're right, uh, AJ, you're right in the Foreign Agriculture Service because we had a funded grant with FAS in Cambodia. So I'll stop from there, but that's the answer to you. In terms of US government funding, that's the response I'll have. Yeah, and sometimes the decision is also that is definitely the without resources we mm -hmm. can't do right so that's the biggest mm -hmm. factor but sometimes also kind of like decision uh, is based on so we have the resources right we have few options so where do we have do we have strong strong partnerships that and it's impossible to kind of like uh, create very strong partnership in 10 different countries because it takes lots of resources time and also kind of like networks, connections, uh, unless there are some flagship uh, programs which has already that kind of mechanism. So also kind of like if you have uh, already built kind of relationship, it makes things a lot easier to tap into those and then kind of like continue the work. In addition, there are some small foundations that you can get engaged with. So that's a potential. So I'm engaged with right now a foundation. It's all connection. So I got engaged with a foundation and they're funding me, fu giving me funds for the Philippines actually. And that's quite open. Those foundations are more, more open than, than, than government funded resources. And I'm excited with your, with your project, Patrick, because I've been dreaming of really bringing design students. Of course, right now I'm very much engaged in the Philippines, but Patrick, if you're interested or others, I think in our engineering program, our senior design, like the Cornell University students, they're raising funds and they like 12 of them went to the Philippines to do service. So they raised funds from, their, from Cornell and they themselves raised the money and they went to the Philippines. But I'm keeping you posted on multiple resources right now, not only in government, but also in other places in the, Uni the United States. The United States is such a rich country. And I'll add, uh, many of my projects uh, are based on the relationships. The relationships, mm -hmm. our relationship in Tanzania is over 10 years old, same for mm -hmm. Honduras. So building on the long-term partnerships that we have um, are what allow us to continue those those part projects and programs. I agree, Patrick. My relationship with the Philippines is since the day I was born. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you. I think um, we have a few more questions here. We're running out of time, but yeah, we have some really good question here. Um, quick question mm -hmm. from Femi, Dr. Shah, what are you using to dry the grains in Tanzania? So it's uh, basically hermetic storage. So we don't use anything. We are just storing it, creating the hermetic condition by repurposing 55 gallon drum. Um, 
and then kind of like um, uh, so that's the that's the mechanism. So some of the innovation is kind of like uh, we had we are integrating the dryer. Uh, oh, sorry, drying, right? So we are integrating the dryer, um, uh, dryer vent, and it can be forced air drying. So, uh, and then it's kind of like the system that you can just be, uh, it's uh, it's not very uh, uh, resource intensive, it's cheap to build. And we just published, uh, the paper that just came out this morning. So if you are interested, we'll be happy to please, send email to Jaden, Dr. Jaden Tatum, who was kind of like, uh, who developed this system. So uh, we'll be happy to share the information. Thanks, Dr. Shah. Um, this, is, uh, this question is for the three of you, but I will, I'm, I'm gonna let Dr. Sauer answer first. Um, how do you measure the success and sustainability of a partnership beyond just financial metrics, ensuring that collaboration continues to benefit all those parties involved? Uh, an excellent question. Uh, I could talk about it in two dimensions. So our, our, our first is we utilize what's called the intercultural development inventory, which is a quantitative assessment that the students that work with me take to try to track what, what are they learning from an intercultural competency and, and navigation lens. And then on our community outcomes or impact lens, uh, we don't just just check financial, but also um, a little bit more on the qualitative side of health uh, and water access metrics. So I can share, and it's something that we always uh, are working to improve and, and always could use more data um, and, and trying to quantify a, a kind of a challenging, what do healthy communities and partnerships look like is an area that we're always working to improve. But I can share an example from our work in Tanzania, uh, where implemented one of our rainwater harvesting systems at the school. And then this was in 2019, the last time that we were there, the teachers of the school conveyed that all the students within that school had passed the government exam for the first time, uh, which for us was, was a great indicator of, of an impact because the students no longer had to bring water to school and they were able to provide lunch. So trying to track metrics like that to see how is the change in water impacting health, education, uh, employment opportunities, so. Thank you, Dr. Sauer. Any um, thoughts about this, Dr. Um, Reyes and Dr. Shah, based on the projects that you worked with in the past? Uh, I think I agree with Patrick. This is very, that's an indirect, but actually direct impact. Very, very meaningful impact because you fed the kids, you provided water. On the, uh, another aspect that I would relay is institutionalization. That's, that's why I emphasize in my slide. So that if the, the project will continue, if, get, if it gets institutionalized, if it continues without the funding of the project, because of the engagement of government, the engagement of the private sector. So those are, that's, that's my addition. I really, I don't think I have much to add to it, but I think uh, just kind of like uh, seeing our technology being adopted or used or kind of like seeing the measurable impact is definitely I mean, funding is just the mechanism to enable us uh, conduct the work, but uh, it's mostly the impact is what we invest uh, or makes us feel more happier about it. All right, thank you all for addressing that question. And as we're coming up on time, I would just like to uh, ask one more time if the panelists have any more um, just advice for the audience and us young professionals as we're preparing and entering careers that might have more and more opportunities for global collaborations and to have a global impact. So how could we prepare for that? Maybe uh, Dr. Reyes, if you could share yeah. first. So, so thank you. for First, let me answer the question quickly on the agricultural machinery question on rice base. The answer is yes. Definitely, we need agricultural machinery. The challenge right now is an answer 
to the private company. The private companies needs to be engaged in the Philippines. Renia, there's a private company, are you foundry? And I'm 100% convinced that unless we make made in the Philippines or made in the country agricultural machineries, forget it about the question of biodiversity enhancement, regenerative agriculture for big systems. Because like in Cambodia, we imported the machinery. It was like $14,000 for a no-till machinery to secondhand from Brazil. So it needs to be a machinery made in the country in answer to your question. And are you foundry? We fabricated the first tractor, four-wheel tractor in the Philippines, and I partnered with a private agency. Jaden, sorry for that, but I let me let me respond to the to, to what you relayed. My my advice is of course you burn your eyebrows. There's no substitute for that. You will have several sleepless nights. You're taking your PhD, you know your sleepless nights. That will continue. Sorry to say, but it is true. That will continue. AJ knows it. When you go to the academe, that will, and then you will go global engagement and you'll go for a tenure. I suggest you engage in global engagement once you're tenured. Forgo that first. Get your tenure first and then engage in global engagement. And then choose a country that you're passionate about and find meaning. There are there is a point that you don't have to choose the country, but maybe there's an availability. Just go to that country, and that will put you into the into the network of USAID, into the network of Foreign Agriculture Service. Once you are in the network, you they can tell you you can find what are the available what are the availability of whichever country you want to engage in. I'll shut up from there. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Shah, what parting advice would you like to share? Yeah. I think I totally agree with what Dr. Rai said. I mean, it's uh, kind of like dedication. It's passion, right? I mean, uh, uh, so it's it's kind of like uh, uh, first thing is kind of like uh, choose about the thing that you are passionate about. For example, are you passionate in the what kind of research? Uh, and then where is the need? Is there a country where you have like better partnership? Again, like just repeating the things that Dr. Raiz said, is there a country where you feel strong about or you, you can build the partnership? Because if you don't have a strong foundational local partnership, it's hard to be successful because it's uh, kind of like it's uh, it's really, really difficult to work uh, being remotely or being in the U.S. and conducting the work in some other country, unless you relocate, um, or it can be, but relocating requires like some of those massive, massive projects, which not everybody is fortunate enough to receive. Okay? It's not just fortunate, but it's not, uh, it's, it's kind of like heavily competitive. So if that's not the case, you will have to be here. You have to kind of like partner. It can be starting with uh, the conversation with some of the stakeholders, uh, some of the kind of like uh, educationalist university or the partners, NGO, INGOs, and try to understand the needs, how you can implement your uh, projects there. And then building the trust, I can, uh, and then earning their, trust, building the trust, relationship. I think all those are needed. So you you need to have the goal. You need to have the passion. You need to identify the right kind of partner. If not, it's hard to implement. Thank you I for sharing that. that. And with that, Dr. Sowers? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll echo uh, similar uh, focusing on the relationship and and strategically planning initiatives um, and figuring out where the overlap is and and even knowing when when you're outside of your lane and, and finding the right partner so I think um, that's my thoughts and I, I do have to run but thank you so much for for having me on the panel and uh, I enjoyed hearing uh, the wonderful questions and everyone's perspective Thank you. Um, thank you once again, Dr. AJ, Dr. Um, Manny, and Dr. Patrick for um, 
sharing your expertise and your global collaboration work with the rest of us, the young professionals, us, um, as we start with our um, careers, um, and a lot of us are also still in school, we definitely need how to navigate in all of these things. Um, so um, just some parting words since it's 1 p.m. already. Um, if you don't know about the ASAB Young Professionals, Professionals Community, you can look us, um, we uh, visit the website here and find more info about us. And feel free to join any committee in the Asabi Young Professionals community by emailing the following um, email. Once again, thank you, Jaden. Thank you for helping me facilitate this um, final discussion. And thank you all for attending. All of the unanswered questions, we will share the email addresses of all of our speakers to you. So you can ask more questions if you want, or you can um, maybe dive in depth with their um, their specific research that they're currently working on and again the recording of this will be available on youtube thank you so much have a good Rochelle, how about the ones above 35 there's a question <laughs> but anyway. I think okay okay i think there's also a lot of organizations within asabe um that you can join for um for people who are about 35 years old. And I can definitely email you on that too, Femi, if, if you want to. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.